In a nutshell, biology is the branch of science that deal with living beings and the vital processes that drive them. Modern sub-branches of biology have been long time in the making, with many important scientists and thinkers throughout history contributing towards them in more ways than one. While we can't make a list of all of them here, because such a video would be several hundred hours long, we can count down the most notable contributions that led to our modern advanced understanding of the tree of life here on Earth, from Darwin's seminal work on the theory of evolution and natural selection, to the mapping of the human genome by the Human Genome Project. Starting with number 10, Leonardo da Vinci's Anatomy Illustrations. Leonardo da Vinci is known for his many artistic masterpieces, like The Mona Lisa and The Last Supper. Not many people, however, know about his pioneering contributions to anatomical studies. As da Vinci was one of the first academic artists in history to provide accurate, detailed drawings of the human anatomy. And a fascination with human anatomy began during his apprenticeship, likely influenced by the works of his master, Verrocchio. By the 1490s, da Vinci's anatomical interest had grown into independent research, resulting in practical dissections of about 30 corpses throughout his lifetime. Leonardo's early studies focused on the skeleton and the muscles, later evolving to include the brain, the heart, the lungs. His anatomical drawings were revolutionary revolutionary to say the least, as he used transparent layers, perspective sections and careful detailing to simplify complex visual details about the different parts of the human body. These drawings would lay the foundation for virtually all modern biological illustrations. I'm reminded a little bit of uh, Michelangelo's um, uh, Sistine Chapel paintings, like the birth, particularly the birth of Adam. And there is a long-standing theory I'm inclined to believe after seeing the Sistine Chapel in person, and that is that the birth of Adam um, uh, is a subtle jab from Michelangelo about the um, the human body. Because if presumably if, if this bit gets left in, you'll see a, a rendering of the birth of Adam now, and you'll notice that um, it looks suspiciously like, the, like you know a cross section of a human brain, like almost eerily so. And the theory is is that Michelangelo like da Vinci, was um, uh, present at a lot of these dissections and was interested in the makeup of the human body. And he put this in as a deliberate jab against the church, because it's like you literally see, like, oh, here's a working, a rendering, an artistic one at that, the human brain, and it's Adam reaching out from the brain to God. The belief there is that's a subtle jab at the idea. It's like, you know, humans gave birth to God from their thoughts, not the other way around. Or at least that's how the theory goes, and it's a theory that I'm inclined to believe, because... You know, Michelangelo was known to be a troll sometimes. Moving swiftly on, number nine, the compound microscope. The first working model of a compound microscope was developed by the Dutch father-son duo Hans and Zacharias Janssen in the late 16th century. Their innovation involved placing lenses at both ends of the tube or tube, creating a magnifying effect which happened when you looked through it. Although their early design laid the groundwork for future advancements, it offered a modest range of magnification, ranging from about three to nine times and produced images of, and I quote, mediocre quality. By the late 1600s, improvements in lens technology improved both magnification and image quality, resulting in some startling breakthroughs and discoveries in the field of biology. For one example, the German scientist Walter Fleming's discovery of cell division in the late 1800s provided crucial for understanding the biological processes like cancer growth. These early microscopes, though limited in their capabilities, paved the way for contemporary microscopy technology, including super-resolution fluorescence microscopy, 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 which are long-lasting implications for the treatment of diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And I'm reminded again of a really interesting theory that like human advancement could be hundreds, uh, potentially thousands of years, like you know, more advanced, for lack of a better term, um, if like people in China drank wine instead of tea. And for anyone who's currently like sat there going, what? The theory posits that because um, the Chinese favoured tea over things like wine, they created pottery rather than glass. And because Chinese glasswork never really got refined, they didn't end up inventing things like eyeglasses, microscopes, telescopes, that sort of thing. And the theory continues that if uh, the Chinese had managed to develop and refine these things, academics, for example, would have had like decades um, uh, like more time to um, study and write because uh, their failing eyesight could have been corrected. Or at least, you know, that's how the theory goes. Moving on, speaking of theories, number eight, the discovery of microorganisms. The discovery of microorganisms in the 17th century could be attributed to Robert Hooke and Antoine van Leeuwenhoek. 
Both of them made long-lasting contributions to our understanding of the microbiome world between 1665 and 1678, recorded in publications by the Royal Society of London. In his 1665 publication, Micrographia, which I've got the full name for here because the full name is a mouthful, and I say that as a small word, so it's Micrographia, or the full name, Micrographia, or some Physiological descriptions of the minute bodies made by magnifying glasses with observation and inquiries thereupon. So, yeah, micrographia. Robert Hooke made the first published description of a microorganism, particularly a microfungus that he got from a book's red sheepskin cover covered in a mould. He also contributed towards the advancement of microscopic techniques described in his preface to micrographia. Inspired by Hooke's work, Lowenhoek began his own observation with a single lens microscope almost a decade later. In his famous Letters on the Protozoa, Lowenhoek gave the detailed descriptions of protoists and bacteria from a variety of environments. And again, fun bonus facts about Robert Hooke. Chances are, while well, I've been talking, a picture of him came up on screen. That's not what Robert Hooke looked like. Um, or it could be, we don't know, because no image of Robert Hooke survives to this day, because he ended up getting into a tiff with Sir Isaac Newton. Yes, that's Sir Isaac Newton. And the story goes that the two men had a kissing contest of sorts, and that when Robert Hooke died, Sir Isaac Newton became more involved with the, um, uh, the Royal Society of London, and while he was there, portraits of Hook were misplaced, and as a result, we have no idea what the man looked like. And as a result, all the portraits purported to be of Robert Hook that survive to this day are either of other people or just the best guess of uh, later artists uh, based on like first-hand accounts of what he was said to look like. Moving swiftly on, number seven, taxonomy. Taxonomy is the science of classifying and naming living organisms. It was developed in the 18th century by Carl Linnaeus, often referred to as the father of taxonomy. His 1735 treatise, the Systema, Natria, which I hope I'm pronouncing correctly, was the first work to detail a classification system that listed and organised every known plant and animal species in the world that they knew of at the time. This systematic approach introduced a binomial nomenclature to the tree of life with a method of assigning Latin names to the genus and species of every organism that we still use to this day. Linnaeus's taxonomy system revolutionised biology by providing a structured framework for organising and naming the array of life here on Earth. It also allowed clear communication amongst scientists worldwide, eliminating confusion caused by the use of lengthy and inconsistent species names specific to separate fields and region of scientific study. Linnaeus is also known as one of the founders of modern ecology, as his work proved the interconnectedness of seemingly different organisms in their natural environments. And a little fun fact about Linnaeus's taxonomy system, you don't have to like follow it, although it's generally regarded as good form to do so. And this has caused some like issues in the past. Uh, one of my favourite examples being, I have the name of it here, the naming of a big prehistoric fish called Leedsichthys problematicus, which literally translates to the problematic fish of Leeds, uh, named after its discoverer. And this was seen as being very uncouth in um, biological circles because the name didn't stick to the accepted nomenclature nomenclature for naming an animal, but it, it, the thing that supersedes that is just the person who discovers the thing. So the person who discovers the thing always gets um, uh, first dibs on what it's called. So there were literally years where like, experts try to rename this thing, and it got to the point where the guy who discovered Leedsichthys problematicus, uh, Alfred Nicholson Leeds, I'm reading from an article I wrote about the subject here because I just found it fascinating, and wrote about it for my own um, uh, channel, Fact Thing with Cal Smallwood, and they sent him threatening letters and uh, basically just spent years trying to discredit him, uh, but ultimately his name won out because he discovered it, he gets to name it, them's the rules. Leedsichthys problematicus problematic fish of leads. Moving on, number six, cell theory. Even after the invention of things like compound microscopes, it would take another two centuries to develop a proper theory of living cells due to several factors. Sometime around the 1830s, our understanding of cells and how they function was transformed by some pretty important discoveries. The first step was Robert Brown's observation of the cell's nucleus in 1833. Then there was the discovery of the cell's nucleus in animal cells, followed by the discovery of the presence of a living material called protoplasm within all cells, particularly 
in plants. And these are all exceptionally fun words to say out loud. The crucial breakthrough in cell theory happened in 1838, though, when the botanist Matthias Jacob Schleiden and the physiologist Theodore Schwann collaborated on the concept. Schwann extended the theory to include animals, bridging the gap between botany and zoology. Their pioneering work proved that cells are the fundamental building blocks of all organisms, plants and animals alike, and that some organisms are unicellular, while others are multicellular. They are also the first scientists to identify the common components of cells as the cell membrane, nucleus, and cell body. All words that we've not used in decades. Number five. Darwin's Theory of Evolution In his 1859 book On the Origin of Species, Charles Darwin first described his theory of evolution by natural selection, a groundbreaking concept that would forever change the scientific field of biology and indeed many others. This theory proposed that species evolve over time through the inheritance of physical or behavioural traits, driven by the concept of natural selection. Darwin's insight revolved around the idea that variations in traits existed within living populations, such as the beak shape in the Galapagos finches. Natural selection, as he argued, is the process through which individuals with advantageous traits for survival and reproduction are more likely to pass it on to the next generation, ultimately leading to evolution of all species we see around us today. And I'm like fascinated by this idea, and I love all the drawings he did of little finches with their little beaks. It's like, look, this beak's short and stout, so this like bird must eat like seeds. But this beak is like long and thin, so that's probably getting like nectar and stuff. Darwin's theory, however, was incomplete without an understanding of the mechanism behind trait inheritance. He lacked knowledge about basic genetics, the role of genes in encoding traits, and the concept of genetic mutations as a source of variation. It would take many more years before that puzzle was solved by subsequent generations of evolutionary biologists, but they all owe like, you know, their existence and their work to the fundamentals inspired by Darwin. Moving on, number four, genetics. The field of genetics traces its history back to the pioneering work of Gregor Mendel in the mid 19th century. Before his experiments, genetics was mostly theoretical. His experiments with pea plants not only expanded the scope of genetics to include experimental aspects, but also laid the foundation for many subsequent developments in the field. In a way, his work directly led to the complete mapping of the human genome with the Human Genome Project in the late 20th century. Through experiments, Mendel formulated three fundamental principles of inheritance, detailing how traits are passed from one generation to the next. His discoveries were instrumental in explaining patterns of genetic inheritance and its impact on biology has been, to put it simply, profound. Genetic studies have revealed the molecular base of inheritance, allowing us to decipher the genetic code and understand how gene encode traits in all living organisms. So, it's for that reason that I've got these wing nuts, this hairline, and this voice. Number three, the Miller-Urey experiments. In 1953, the Miller-Urey experiments conducted at the University of Chicago marked a pivotal moment in the study of, and I hope I can pronounce this correctly, abiogenesis, or the origin of life from non-living matter. The experiments aim to replicate the conditions of Earth's early atmosphere and oceans to investigate whether organic molecules, the building box of life, could emerge from purely inorganic chemical reactions. Stanley Miller, under the supervisation of Harold C. Ure, simulated the primitive Earth environment, which was then thought to have an atmosphere devoid of oxygen. The experiment successfully produced amino acids and various organic molecules fundamental to life. While the study had limitations and was later refined by other researchers with more accurate information on Earth's early atmosphere, it began a phase of extensive research in prebiotic chemistry and the study of life's emergence from non-life that continues to today. While we still don't know the exact origins of life here on Earth, the Miller-Urey experiments prove that it could have happened through external energy sources like lightning or UV radiation, interacting with basic non-living constituents. And I've been to like the Field Museum in Chicago, and I've seen like you know, that fish. Do you know that fish that everyone hates? You know the fish. We all know the fish, right? It's like it's the the first fish to walk on land, and like everyone's there, like, every millennial's there, pointing at it, going, "This is the thing. This is why I've got anxiety." Screw this fish. But before you get to that section, you also have like, here's just a rock. And like, here's a rock with what we think might be the earliest examples of like single-celled organisms that were just birthed seemingly out of the ether. It's cool. 
I, I love history. Number two, stem cells. The concept of stem cells was first proposed in the 19th century, initially in the context of the foundation of embryonic development. It wasn't until the late 1960s, however, that researchers identified and characterized stem cells within the bone marrow, particularly those responsible for producing various types of blood cells. This discovery laid the foundation for bone marrow transplants, initially introduced as a treatment for cancer and genetic blood disorders. Today, stem cells are integral to about 60,000 BMT procedures worldwide, each and every year. Further advances in stem cell research led to the identification of stem cells in human cord blood in 1978 and the cultivation of embryonic stem cells from mice a few years later. In the years since, stem cells have evolved from research tools for studying cell differentiation mechanisms to powerful resources for testing new medicines, reducing the need for animal testing. Cancer stem cells have since been regularly used to screen anti-tumor drugs, and the stem cell therapy is currently under investigation in over 1,100 clinical studies. To quote that family guy thing, I'm like, why are we not funding this? Finally, number one the Human Genome Project. So the Human Genome Project began in 1990 as an international collaboration aimed at decoding the genetic blueprint of the human organism. Finished in 2003, the global effort successfully determined, documented, and then publicly shared the sequences of nearly all the genetic contents within the human genome, which as we now know is made up of nearly 3 billion chemical base pairs. While admittedly individual researchers had deciphered portions of human genes before this project, the majority of the genes genome had largely remained unexplored. A rough draft was announced by the team in 2000s, followed by the project's completion in April 2003, on the 50th anniversary of the discovery of the DNA's double helix structure. The Human Genome Project started as a new phase in biological research, allowing scientists to study the genetic basis of diseases, develop targeted therapies, and further advance the field of personalized medicine. And we can only excitedly look to the future for what comes next. So I hope everyone watching at home found this video entertaining, educational, and informative. I certainly found the script to be all three of those things. If you did like it, leave a like. If you've got any comments, feedback, suggestions, or things you'd like to cover in future, do so in the comments. Subscribe for more. Follow myself and the writer of this um, uh, script on social media. Check out our sister channel. Check out my own channels and all that good stuff. And as I always like to say, and this is my final recording session of the day, go out there and have the day that you all deserve. Thank you. Ha <laughs>